So uh, this morning I want to speak briefly on the subject of temptation. And I think that we all sort of know how it works, but it's good to be reminded from time to time. And let me begin by asking you, what is it that you want? What is it that you crave, covet? desire. You see, we all have a sinful nature. Now, we might crave different things, but there is at least something or some things that you crave. And some of those things may not be bad in and of themselves, but we may grow. For instance, a teenage girl may want to be loved. But if she doesn't feel loved, then she may incorrectly mistaken promiscuous premarital sex as love. And then that desire would become a temptation for her. I may like and crave a hot, homemade cinnamon roll straight out of the oven. But I don't need four of them do it. So if you are a Christian this morning, and if you're honest, you know what you crave. You know what you desire. You know what you normally go after. And you've heard me say it many times before, and I'll say it again this morning. The devil is sort of like a patient fisherman. And he has been watching you very closely for a long time. And he knows exactly what kind of bait to put on the end of that hook to get you to chase after. And that's what he does. He watches us and he puts bait on, on the end of that hook to get us to take a bite. Now what you bite, what you go after, may not be what I go after. And what is appealing to me and what allures me, you may not even give a second look. So I want us to look at what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And perhaps some of Paul's readers during this time were tempted to chase after idols. And so Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, this is what he says. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. I'm going to read the New Living Translation, which is sort of a thought for thought translation. And it says this for comparison. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out so that you can endure. Do you think, and I'll answer this question, do you think it is a sin to be tempted? Yes or no? It's not a sin to be tempted. Think about our Lord Jesus, who was perfect and sinless. Remember, He was tempted in the wilderness of the devil. Many other characters in the Bible were tempted. We think about King David, as he saw the beautiful Bathsheba bathing there on the rooftop. We also think about Eve in the Garden of Eden with that fruit. So what we need to know in the beginning, what I want us to understand from the outright here is this. All of us will and do face various temptations. That's a given. You cannot avoid temptations. And the verse preceding this one says, don't become so prideful that you think that you will not sin. Those who begin to think that they're standing on their own and do not need God, beware. Because those individuals are about to take a fall. So that's sort of a warning to every person in this room and every person in the church yard this morning.
should be on alert. Now, George Barnum conducted a survey among Americans asking what some of the temptations were that, and they self-reported these that they struggled with the most. And it's sort of a checklist. Well, 60% of Americans said that they were tempted to worry and be anxious about things in life. Another 60% said that they were tempted to procrastinate, to put things off that need to be done. Why do it today when you can do it tomorrow? Is sort of our mindset. That's a common temptation. 55% said that they were overwhelmed with the temptation to eat too much. You know, you go to sit down for Sunday dinner today and there's that temptation to eat too much. 44% of Americans said that they were tempted to overuse electronics, to be on social media, Facebook, Snapchat, all these things too much. And 41% said that they were tempted just to be plain lazy. And I don't know if any of these temptations are a struggle for you, but at the end of the day, what each of us have within us is this voice that is screaming, Feed me. Whatever that temptation is, that voice is saying, Feed me. Feed me. Feed me. I was listening to a program on the way to work the other morning, and they have various people on from time to time. It's a family Christian program, and there was a lady on there that was talking, and she was a former practicing homosexual. This lady was. And they were asking the question on there, what do you do if your child comes home and says, I'm gay? And then in later years, what do you do as far as that lifestyle, this choice? How do you counsel them? How do you help them? How do you continue to combat that temptation? And this is the average person's feelings about a lot of things in life, and not just with homosexuality, but with a lot of things. A lot of people think, well, if this makes me happy, if this makes me feel good, if I enjoy this, then this must be what God wants for me. Because this is what makes me happy. But by the way, God never said that His desire, His will for us, is for us to be happy. You won't find that in God's Word. You know, so a lot of people will say, if what I'm doing makes me happy, God wants me to be happy, then what's wrong with it? That would be what a lot of people would say. But with that temptation, and any temptation that goes against God's Word, she made a good point on how to continue to resist harmful temptation. And here is the good question that you should ask, and I should ask myself whenever I'm tempted. She said this, Is what my flesh is promising me better than what Christ has promised me? Well, say that again. Whenever you have that temptation, knock and scream, feed me, feed me, feed me, ask yourself, is what my flesh is promising me better than what Christ has promised me? You see, your flesh and that old devil, he will promise things just like he did Eve in the garden. What did he tell Eve? He said, eat of this fruit and your eyes will be open and you'll be as gods, he said. Yes, their eyes were open. But they discovered that they were naked and ashamed. And the Bible says that they hid. And I'm going to tell you something. And it's not easy, but it's necessary. When we are dealing with some temptation, some sin, both grace and truth are needed for us and those that we love. What do I mean by that? Take the example of cinnamon rolls. Let's say that I love not just a cinnamon roll, but let's say that I love cinnamon rolls, plural. 
One is not enough to please me. It's just enough to make me mad perhaps. And grace is loving me enough to make me a, a can of cinnamon rolls. Maggie, makes, Maggie is the baker in our house. She loves to bake. And Maggie may go in and bake a pan full of cinnamon rolls and that's so nice of her. But suppose that I'm a diabetic and all those cinnamon rolls aren't good for me. But she loves me so she just keeps baking and bringing me cinnamon rolls and I just eat one after another. That's the grace, the gracious part of it. But the truth part of it is, is that they're not good for me and I don't need them in excess like that. You could take this scenario and use it with homosexuality, premarital sex, those who shack up and live together without being married. We could use this scenario with drugs or anything else. We love the person with grace, but grace without truth only helps a person to destroy themselves. If I don't speak up and help my loved one, then I'm just going to stand by and watch them destroy themselves. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So who owns me? Who owns you this morning? Christ does. He does. Not the drug, not the sexual temptation, or anything or anyone else. And we see in our text that God gives a way of escape. What does it say at the end of verse 13? With the temptation, He makes a way of escape. Now He doesn't say it will be easy. To resist another sin in the road will not be easy. To resist another pill will not be easy. To resist caving in to all those anxious and worrisome thoughts will not be easy. To resist getting off of social media will not be easy and paying your family some attention perhaps. But what we do see here in verse 13, he doesn't say it's easy, but what he tells us is that it's possible. Amen? That's what he says. It's possible. Here's a good question that you may ask, and sometimes people ask this question. If God is so powerful, why doesn't God just go ahead and destroy Satan? Go ahead and kill Satan so he's not around? And go ahead and, and sort of get rid of all of these, these sinful temptations, our attraction for sin? Why doesn't he just take all those desires that aren't good for us? Why don't he just take all that away? Why doesn't God just do that right now? And then we could just walk out of here and have a happy life. But if He did that, we would lose the ability to be overcomers in Christ. You see, if there is no opposition, then there is no victory. God has not called you and me to a life of ease and happiness, but to a life of victory. And we cannot enjoy that victory until we have faced temptation, until we have faced evil, and we've overcome. Now quickly, I want us to break down this verse into parts uh, for just a few more minutes here. And he begins this verse, verse 13. He says, There have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. What does that mean when he says your temptations are common? In other words, someone else has experienced the same temptation as I'm facing and has gotten victory over it through Christ. Sometimes people will try to tell you, Jeffrey, you, you just don't understand my situation, though. You, you don't understand how strong the temptation, the urge is for me because of this or that that I went through. You just don't understand my part of it, though, Jeffrey. My, my temper, my anxiety, my problem. No, God's Word says that you, the temptation that you are experiencing is no different than anyone else's. So quit trying to come up with excuses as to why you're doing it. Why do you keep running back to it? It's common, he says. Why? He says, man. 
understand that God is sort of overseeing all of your temptations that are coming your way. Think about the study on Job some time ago. God limits the temptations depending on your ability to resist. And you can't blame giving in to temptation on anyone but who? Yourself. Reminds me of a story I read about the little boy at the candy store. There's a little boy in the candy store and he was just standing there in front of the candy staring at the candy. And there was a clerk there that was watching him and the clerk thought the little boy was going to grab some candy and put it in his pocket at any moment and run out of the store. And so the clerk watched him for a while and the clerk went over there and asked the little boy and said to the little boy, you look like you're trying to take some candy. The little boy replied, you're wrong, mister. I'm trying not to. That's what he said. You see, that's how temptation works. We stare at it for a while. We think about it for a little while. And remember that question. Is what my flesh is promising me better than what God, Christ, has promised me? To steal that candy would bring humiliation to that child and his parents and would not be a good thing. But something else that God provides for us in temptation, we already mentioned it, God will make a way for so that you can bear it, so that you can endure it. When you are tempted, there's going to be an open door. That's what He's promised. You say, well, what is that open door? That open door might be some distraction. It might be somebody not saying to you know, to pull you away from that temptation. It might be that your phone rings. Somebody's calling. God's providing a way to pull you away from that temptation. It might be whatever. That's your door. That's your way out of this temptation. And you either choose that way out or you hold on to it. Again, the Bible doesn't say that it will be easy to walk away from it. But it is possible. Again, the temptation is not the sin. It's giving in to the temptation. That's the sin. God, God has promised a way out for you. Whatever temptation. And I said at the very beginning, everybody in this room, from the front to the back, left to the right, everyone outside of the cars, God knows your heart. He knows what you crave and what you desire that's not good for you this morning. And God has promised to provide a way out. He has promised to provide an escape for you. But you must choose to walk through that open door. The alcoholic has to choose to not take a drink. He must do something else instead. The businessman has to choose to not accept the advances of the flirtatious secretary. He should take his wife to dinner instead. The boy has to choose that the candy, and remember that the candy does not belong to him. And I don't have to go for a third helping of mashed potatoes. I must choose to do that. On and on we can go. Remember what James said in chapter 1, verse 13. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust or desire and entice. And those desires, that's where it starts. And we're tempted every day by a patient fisherman who just is constantly trying to lure us in with bait. So he'll try some bait with you this afternoon, I'm sure. And if that one doesn't work, he'll change it out and he'll have to bring something else back. See if you'll bite it. If that doesn't work, change it out and try something else again. And eventually you may bite. But that old devil, he wants to deceive you. He wants to disrupt. He wants to divide. And He wants to destroy. That's what He wants to do. He wants to destroy. Don't let You don't have to let And when the choice is difficult, and when you're struggling, 
Instead of thinking of that temporary pleasure of that moment and what Satan, the old devil, is promising you, like he did Eve in the garden, making all these promises, remember, he wants to destroy you. And ask yourself, is what my flesh is promising me in this moment better than what Christ is promising me? And remember at the end of the day, he created you. You belong to Him. He loves you. He died for you. Choose Him. Choose Him in those moments of temptation. I'm going to lead us in a prayer of at this time and then the ushers on the outside will come forward and they'll collect on the outside and those of you who'd like to give on the inside you just give on your way out in a moment. Those of you on the inside, you'll just remain seated. Would you bow for me, please? Father in heaven, we thank you for these few moments to share your word on temptation. Lord, temptation is something that everyone faces from little children all the way up to the day we die. There are things that we crave. There are things that we desire. Lord, I pray we will ask ourselves this very important question. Is what my flesh, what the devil is promising me then, than what Christ is promising me? And Lord, we know that your plans are so much greater. That old temptation isn't worth losing my family. That old temptation isn't worth losing my testimony for you. That old temptation isn't worth losing my life. You died for our sins. And Lord, we thank you that you provided a way to stay when we are tempted. Lord, bless and handle this offering that we're about to receive. And as this meal place, Lord, might we contemplate our own, our own desires. Lord, help us to fill our hearts with desire to serve you, to crave and after your word. Lord, bless now we pray in Jesus' name.